Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. All right. Hey, it's great to see you this morning. I uh, hope you've had a good weekend, everybody. Hope your team's won or not or something. Probably a good time. It's uh, college football season, which I love college football season. Not as much as basketball season, but that's another story. Probably a good time to remind you uh, not to base your happiness on what a group of 18 to 22-year-olds do with a football. <laughs> Can I just throw that out there? That's a little prophetic word for some of us. Um, there's a lot, and they, hey, that's part of why we're here today, kind of get our minds back to what matters the most, right? Have you, have you ever found your mind uh, go on autopilot? Anybody? Now, a lot of, a lot of men here are probably like, yeah, like right now, you know. Um, it's funny, I had this conversation with some friends this week. Uh, we were with some couples, and, and one, of the, one of the gals was just talking about how incredible it is that a man... You know, you ask a man at, at certain times, and, and women, you've seen this, whether you're dating someone or, or married, and you know, it's like, well, well hey, what, what are you thinking about? Nothing. <laughs> and it's like, how do, really? Like, is that possible not to think of anything? I don't think it's quite possible, but it's possible for your mind to kind of drift. Uh, not that this ever happens to me. You know, while Stacy is, is talking to me, I'm just totally focused. I'm, I'm all in. Um, but it's possible, right? Have you ever found yourself, like maybe you're driving home from work, uh, you got a 20 minute you know, drive or something, and then you end up home and you're like, wow, I don't even remember like the drive. <laughs> How did I get here? Sometimes that happens. How did I get here? Uh, wait, what am I doing here? Why am I here? Perhaps that happened. Now you're going, I'm concerned about my pastor. Now, I, this never happens to me. But perhaps, perhaps something like that has happened. It's possible for that to happen in life. You ever found yourself like, how did I get here? Maybe in a job or somewhere. Um, what am I doing here? It's possible to happen that that happens here. I mean, like right here on Sunday mornings. It's possible that we've kicked into kind of an autopilot, almost like uh, sleepwalking. I'm always intrigued. Anybody ever, anybody ever, anybody sleep, slept, walked, sleep, walked before anybody here? Any, don't be embarrassed. I mean, that's kind of cool. I wish I could do that. Uh, anybody ever seen someone sleepwalk? Um, that's a crazy thing. And you kind of wake them up or you don't. I don't know how that works. I've never really dealt with that. But, um, you know, you're supposed to kind of be gentle with them, I guess. But there's a time at which you wake up and go, how did I get here? And it's possible for that to happen here. And when you think about it for a moment, about what we do when we gather on Sunday mornings, it's really kind of a crazy thing. Now, I'm assuming that most of you have been to church before. We have some first-time guests here whom I've met already. Uh, but mostly in North Dallas, you know, we come across sometimes, and there may be somebody in a crowd this size who's never been to church before. But if you started to come hang out with us a little bit, and you've never really done the Sunday gathering, it's really kind of an odd thing. And for those of, those of us who, who do it every week, or maybe throughout our lives, we've been doing it. Think about it. We come together. We get up early on Sunday morning, for one thing, while all our neighbors are like sleeping in. Um, we we start to think about it on Saturday night. You can imagine, I, I'm, I'm doing this. We, we start to think, I got to get up in the morning. Uh, and then we gather with people that we may or may not know that well. Now, some of us know each other very well. But we gather with people across generations. And from different life experiences who we would not otherwise necessarily be friends with. Or, or gather with. And not only that, we get together and we sing songs together. Where else does that happen? I mean, you might say, well, at a, at a game, or not, not so much. 
We sing songs. And we sing songs to, to a man who many believe died permanently 2,000 years ago. And we sing to him. And then we pause, as we're doing now, we stop for a moment, and we hear someone speak out of a book that was written a long time ago. Every now and then, somebody goes swimming, or at least kind of wades into the water. Uh, we have a little snack time every now and then, um, where we eat crackers and juice, and we, we do a crazy thing. When you think about it, it's kind of odd. And maybe you haven't thought about it a whole lot, and you've kicked in to a kind of autopilot. And today, I'm going to talk about the gathering. I'm going to talk about what we do when we come together. All right, so I want you to think with me as we walk through this series of messages. We're going to be uh, in the book of Ephesians. You can go ahead and turn to Ephesians 4 if you want to there. I hope you have your Bible. Um, but I wonder as you turn there, what do you feel? What do you think? And I'm just going to challenge you. Even this morning, what have you been feeling, sensing? What do you feel about corporate worship? You know, how do you how do you approach it? How do you uh, how do you really focus during it? Maybe some of you, frankly, maybe you feel nothing much, and you come here. Maybe you've come out of habit. Habit's a good thing. We'll talk about that a little bit today. But how do you feel about it? Does the Lord need to ignite something new in you? So today we're going to talk about worship. Really, the power of corporate worship. And before you think, Jeff, I've got a lot going on in my life. Can we not just kind of talk about my life and be encouraged? And I'm going to tell you that this is going to be a message that I think can change your life as you think again about the power of what we do here today. We're going to ask three questions, all right, to, to shape this, to, to frame this message. The first one is how, uh, how did we get here? So it's kind of this, oh, this awakening. What are we doing here and why do we do it? All right. So all of this is in the context of this series that Justin mentioned, uh, The Power of One. We're going to be talking about unity and, and specifically unity in Christ and his mission as we walk through this uh, series together this month. Right here, a timely message for us as a church family. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 12, 27. You can see it on the screen there. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Now I'm primarily going to be speaking to those who are believers those who are Christians, and many of us who've joined this church, or maybe you haven't yet joined, but this is the church that you come to, the gathering you attend when you come. We're going to talk about each week worship, how we are to connect with one another, do life together, how, do we, how we're to serve together, and then multiply, how we make disciples as a people. And we're going to look at this amazing gift. My hope is that you'll be uh, just stirred up again uh, and, and, and with great gratitude, praise God for the fact that we can come together and we have a church to come to. Now, I know there's a lot of churches around North Dallas, but to be grateful for our unique, specific church in particular, one that many of you have invested your lives in. And for those of you who haven't, I'm going to challenge you to do so and why you should do this. All right. So uh, it's, it's what Charles Spurgeon called with all of our failures and faults and shortcomings. He said the church, the body of Christ is the dearest place on earth. Now, some of you may not think that. Some of you say, eh, maybe, maybe not, maybe. The scriptures teach us that this is exactly the case. And so look at Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to look uh, verses 1 through 6. Now, all the, here on Places in Context here, when we come to a passage like this, verses 1 through 16 are born out of chapters 1 through 3. Uh, all that's happened up to this point is what Paul does in typical Pauline fashion. He has been talking about who we are in Christ. It's what we've said is, are the gospel indicatives, really the facts about who we are, which is most important. All right, so you start there. Uh, we've been rescued from our sins. Christ has died on the cross for us. We've now been raised up with him. We are now a part of the family of God as brothers and sisters. And so this then is why we see here thus the therefore. So all that's happened before, then he says to walk. And this is going to lead us to verses 17 through uh, really chapter 6, verse 20. We're not going to get there today, but it's really an exhortation here. We're going to see of four graces or characteristics, all right, of this new life we have in Christ, which lead to what I would call a sevenfold unity, all right, of the body described in verses 7 through 16. So this passage really introduces the big idea that's coming. We're going to look at 
is that di- diversity is necessary for true unity. And he says diversity in the body, loving each other in our differences, is the way the church is built up into full maturity. That's an interesting concept to think about. So let's read chapter 4, verses 1. Uh, let's go 1 through 6 today. I, therefore... A prisoner of the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Okay, so let's unpack this a little bit. This passage here, we're going to ask the first question, all right? How did we get here? What draws a group of people together across, again, across different backgrounds, uh, across generations, people who maybe would not otherwise be together, different families, different friends from all over Dallas, even from around the world. We have people here today. What unites us? It's the same thing that has united the church for two millennia. Really jump to to verse 4, because what unites us is what has united the Orthodox biblical church since its founding. And this is important to remember. We're talking about essentials here. You've heard me say, if you've been around here much, um, in, in all things core, all right, or essential, unity. In all things non-core, freedom. But in all things, grace. And we get confused, and any organization is true, but certainly in the church, we get confused about what's essential and what's not essential. And here, we find what is essential. What unites us? Well, we know it's Christ. But I want you to see then, uh, the gospel brings about this unity. We could call it, what, you know, what, what unites us? The ones. The ones. The ones are born out of the gospel. Our confession, that is our declaration, which is the gospel, draws us together the power of one. So first we see it. And you, you, you can see it there real simply. Now, first, it's one body. We're all parts of the very body of Christ. We're his visible presence in the world, Right? You are one with the person sitting next to you. You are one with them. You might be the toe. You might be the pinky. You may be, I don't know, some the appendix. Um, You're about to blow up and we don't know why you're here, but you're about to kill all of us. I don't know. You could be any part of the body. That's probably not the best part, but... um, it happens. And so we're all a part of the same body. You're, you're one with the person next to you. Secondly, the Spirit. He says one Spirit. His Holy Spirit unites us. The Spirit resides in every single person who is here if they're in Christ. And so when we're together, like I've said recently, like Pentecost, we have this flame. We have the Spirit over us, in us. But when we're together, we're truly lit as a body like we aren't otherwise. I mean, you're a little flame when you're out there doing your thing tomorrow morning. Praise God, we're going to be the scattered church at school, in the workplace, at business, in your home. But when we come together, we light this place up because every person around you has the Spirit within them. Third is our hope. We have one hope. We have the same singular hope. We have placed our hope in Christ, and He is Himself our hope. We have this you, this, this unity, this oneness. You don't have this with people who are not in the body. You know, you go to work or to school or somewhere, you find it here. Number four, you have one Lord. We have the same leader of our lives, you could say. One master. You know, there are a million masters that people uh, live according to or who guide them. Often it's ourselves. We have, every one of us here, the same master. This is really interesting. We have the same Lord, Master King, who guides us collectively. Let me ask you this. Is Jesus Lord of your life? Have you received His grace? Have you allowed Him, if you will? I mean, He is Lord, but have you allowed Him to be Lord of your life? And then fifth, one faith. We all place our faith. This is another way of saying we've placed our trust in Him. Again, people place their trust in something. 
We all have placed our trust in Christ, our faith in Him, in the same place, the same person, Jesus Christ. And then he says one baptism. Now, now what does that mean? That doesn't mean like a massive, we all had were baptized at the same time, but all uh, have received Christ. So he lived the perfect life for us. He died on the cross, so he was buried. He was raised up. And we too then follow him, die to ourselves, forgiven, raised up in him to live a new life. We're all united by one proclamation, one confession, which is seen in the life of the believer through the ordinance of baptism. One baptism unites us together. And by the way, if you've not yet proclaimed, confessed to the world that you've received Christ, uh, we're going to be baptizing next week. And we'd love for you to come and find us after the service. Why wouldn't you do that? We've talked about that recently. Why wouldn't you do that? Just to proclaim to the world that you are one in Christ and join the family. So we're going to be baptizing out in the front of the church next week outside. It's going to be an awesome time. So we'd love to talk to you about that. Call our office, call a minister. We'd, we'd love to help you there. Number seven, one God, he says. We worship the same God. And then one Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. We are all beloved by the same Father. There again, you are brothers and sisters. We're sons and daughters of God, our Father. And we're here together. You're a brother or sister with the people who are sitting around you. These are the ones that, unites, uh, that unite us. Again, look at this. There's no mention here. Okay, let me, let me say it this way. These are the essentials. I've said that. These are the core, right? So anything that's not mentioned here is not core by definition. It's not, not essential. And anything that you make essential, like let's add a few things to it, like some of my preferences. Here's some things I want to be a part of this list. Well, we call that heresy, you know, theologically. Um, because this is, these are the essentials. This is what unites us as a church family. And so there's no mention of, of skin color. There's no mention of what tribe you came from or where your family's from. There's no mention of age or musical preference. There's no, there's no mention of, well, I like that style and those songs, and I can't, I can't worship if they're doing that. If, if there's an organ being played, I, can't, I just can't. Are you kidding me? I can't exalt Christ to rescue me from my sin if somebody's playing the drums in the room. Really? You know, when you start to think about the way that we get a little crazy, and we kind of all have done this. I mean, our words after worship betray our misunderstanding. I didn't get anything out of worship today. Really? Who did you think it was for? Holy smoke. I, and confessionally, you know, I'm sure I've done that. Like left going, meh. You know, um, I mean, not here ever, but I'm sure that's happened. I'm sure that the sermon, you know, um, we've all done this. And it shows us that we need to be taught again. We need to be brought back. We've been sleepwalking. We've been on autopilot and we've forgotten. What are we doing here? And this is the next question I want us to look at. We're, we're showcasing this unity. That's what we're doing. We're displaying the power of one. How do we do this? Well, he's told us. It's by what's called, uh, theologians call it the, the four graces. Practicing the four graces. We see it here. Just prior to the ones, he says, this is how you're going to walk. Four gifts from God, which is why they're called graces, given to us to live out uh, this new life that he's given us. Okay? So this is where we test our hearts. When you come here, uh, you're going to be focused on what matters most. And so when you think about it, when, when these things are what unites us, what we just looked at, the ones, does it really matter? Um, does the music really matter? I mean, you, you might say, well, yeah, you know, I certain music I like, you know, and, and most often that has to do with your own background than it does anything, not something theological necessarily. We all have preferences. I get that. But does it really matter in the end? Again, if you say, well, I can't worship God, uh, just singing hymns can't do that. The God who gave you breath today, who rescued you from your sin for eternity, and you're just withholding praise because I don't like that kind of song. Really. Or consider the room. Nah, I can't, can't do it. 
Don't go to the, that room, Great Hall. Can't. Sanctuary, just not feeling it. I mean, really? Friends, what, what have we turned worship into, right? We, we've become self-focused, so many of us. And I'm, this is not unique. I mean, it's across the life of the church these days, but this kind of consumer, kind of driven thing. But how do we do that? How can I test my heart? Well, it's practicing these four graces. Here they are. You see them there. Um, humility, gentleness, patience, and love. Paul says, these are the practices, the grace that God has given us as, as new creations in him. So when you approach the body, whether it's in worship or in your group, your Bible study or in ministry, we, we approach it with humility, gentleness, patience and love. The weekly gathering of God's people is a, is a constant rhythm of grace that he's given to us. Friends, be reminded of the blessed gift the church is to you. It's such a precious thing for us to come together and we come humbly, we come gentle with one another, we come patient and we come loving. And I'm so grateful that we are, if you're a guest, we are that kind of a church. I'm encouraged by being here today. I mean, the moment I step on the campus and start to see faces and people, I'm stirred up. I'm reminded today in our song, our, our singing uh, of, of what my life really is all about. I was a part of a funeral yesterday. I told our worship team, you know, I, I've often said you ought to go to a funeral about once a week. And then I thought, no, you ought to go to worship like once a week. That's better uh, than a funeral. But it reminds us of who we are, it reminds us of where we're heading where this life is going. So the third question that I want us to answer is this one. Why do we do it? All right, so, so how did we get here? Well, we got here through the ones. We have been rescued from our sin, and now we're one in Christ. That's how we got here. That's why you're here. Well, what are we doing here? Well, we're practicing the four graces to display the unity. And without being humble, gentle, patient, and loving, we, we're not going to do that. But together we can, and we will, and we are. And then, why do we do it? Now, here I want to kind of bring us to another passage of Scripture. Okay, so with your Bible there in front of you, I want you to turn to Hebrews 10. Hebrews chapter 10, because this passage will serve as a kind of manifesto as to what we're doing uh, and hoping to accomplish by all of this oddity that we experience here on Sunday mornings. What seems so odd makes sense as we look at the scriptures and already through the ones, through the practicing of the four graces, and then in Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. The writer of Hebrews has another therefore. Now you can imagine, he's been talking about how Christ is greater. Christ is all, and he has saved us from our sin. He's the new high priest. He's the perfect lamb of God. And so he says, because of all that he's done for us, because your new life that you have in him, therefore... Hebrews 10, 19, brothers and sisters, that's implied, by the way, since we have confidence to enter the holy places. So this is the most holy place, the holy of holies, by the blood of Jesus. He's saying now we have access, we can come into the presence of God because of Jesus. By the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. Right? So no longer a veil between us and God in the Holy of Holies. We enter in through Christ. In verse 21, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, he's already unpacked that quite a bit. Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. All right, so the writer of Hebrews tells us that, that, that 
We do this for several reasons. Now, I want you to see there's six of them that I want to draw from. All right. So we see it right here. I, I was reading articles. I wondered as, as Travis Cook and Sam Silva and I were working through this passage and thinking about how to present. Okay, let's talk about reasons we gather for worship. Because initially I thought, well, let's have a sermon. Ten reasons we gather to worship on Sunday. I found an article, uh, 99 reasons to gather. And I thought, I don't have time you know, for that one. But, um, but then uh, found this text that really shows us what we're doing here. Okay, so look at, look at this. First of all, why do we do this? Well, to lift up, to exalt Christ, to exalt Him because of all that He's done for us. Why do you get up early to come together here? You know, why would we wake up and get here by 9.15? When we start, just a reminder, some of you are going to be, I mean, you're going to be on time tomorrow to school. You're going to be. I talked to a young mom already this morning. She said we were almost on time every day this week. I was like, that's an accomplishment, right? And yet we kind of casually stroll into worship. Why? I think we forgot we've fallen asleep. We've kicked into autopilot. We come to exalt Christ. He's created us. He's given us breath today. We can't wait to get here, to draw near to Him. So we lift Him up. And then secondly, to look back, to remember, see in verse 20, what He has done for us, His body broken for us on the cross. And we do so without wavering. We hold fast the confession of our hope. What is that? It's the gospel. It's what he's done without wavering to remember. And our two ordinances that we practice, baptism and the Lord's Supper, remind us of what he's done for us. Thirdly, to show off. To show off. We we draw near in worship because the high priest Jesus has made a way for us. That's why we're singing songs together. We sing boldly out of our hearts, filled with gratitude. We sing directly to him. We do so to build up. Verse 23, encouraging one another, hearing the word preached, calling out sin, remain, you know, remaining accountable with other believers so that sin won't overtake us. We're here to stir up. I love this one. Our gatherings together stir something up within us. And it's like a, it's like, it's like a cook in the kitchen, you know, or, or somebody like my mom can do this. Like, like I just whipped up something, you know, like you whip this up, you know, like a cake or something or some incredible meal. And so, you know, you ask someone, what are you whipping up? Oh, nothing, just a cake, you know. What are we whipping up here on Sunday morning? What are we stirring up? We're stirring up affections for Jesus that will lead us towards love and good deeds. That's what we're doing here. We stir up within us. And here's what happens. Some of you came this morning, let's be honest. Some of us came here and we're like, man, I've had a horrible week. Sometimes you come and you're not feeling much of anything towards God. You don't have much affection towards Him and His Word. Maybe you're here out of, again, out of, out of habit, which is a good thing. Maybe you were drug here. You know, maybe you, sorry, students, you came, came before you, because your parents came. But what happens is when we gather, you felt it today, did you not? If you're watching, not on autopilot, sometimes you need others to worship for you. That may sound strange, but sometimes the faith of others encourages you. Like, I'm not even sure I can trust God this week or today. I don't really feel like singing to him. I'm kind of angry with him, actually. But then people around you seem to be joyful. Maybe they have a little better week or maybe their faith is just stronger than yours. And sometimes you can rest in the faith of another. We stir up what is dormant within us. And maybe throughout the week we weren't walking with Christ. And then we come together and we're stirred up. And our affections are stirred up. And no longer, it's like, it's like we activate within each other something that we did not, uh, you know, activate otherwise. We, we were not doing it. And so what we do together matters so much. Notice that the writer says there's a bad habit that you can form when you neglect the weekly gathering. You know, friends, think about this. Why habitual worship is so important. Why do we worship weekly? We've been commanded to, but why do we do it? It's like watching your kids grow. 
I mean, you don't just sit there and just like stare at them. I mean, that, that's kind of weird. Like, I'm just, what are you doing watching you grow? You could stare for months and you wouldn't see a difference. But over time you do. It's, it's kind of like working out, right? You don't go to the gym once and then look in the mirror and go, man, I am, I am so jacked. Look at me, you know, or losing weight, you know, like, gosh, I've been on this diet for like gosh, six hours. I mean, it's killing me. <laughs> And um, I see no change at all. But over time, people who see you, who didn't see you maybe for a while, they're like, oh my gosh, look at you. Same as with worship. You know, it's like, a, it's like, um, it's like gathering for a meal as a family. You know, when our kids were growing up, you know, we didn't have just a joyful, wonderful time every time we gathered. When our kids were really little, we had injuries during dinner time. Uh, like with twins, you know, falling out of stuff and stuff going everywhere. And, you know, but over time, it shapes our relationships and shaped our home. A habit. Friends, the gathering weekly, I could argue, is the most important habit of a believer. Because it practices the three essential aspects of our, of our faith. Hearing from God. All right, having his, we, having his ear, praying as we did even today and together collectively and living in a family of faith and all that comes with that, the ones that come with that. And so the gathering is so critical and over time you do see a dramatic change. The trajectory of your life has changed. And then finally, and I'll land with this, why do we come together? Why do we do this? To get ready. To get ready for the day, he calls it in verse, verse, verse 25. We worship because it reminds us of where we're heading. We keep one eye on eternity regardless of what we're doing, what we're going through. We come here on Sundays to help us get ready for an eternal gathering of the nations together to worship and exalt Jesus. You think about it. Why do we, well, can we gather? We talk about how we scatter. Why do we evangelize? Why do we seek to share Christ with us? Why do we go on missions, mission trips? Listen, missions exists because worship does not. That's why we go. We go to share Christ with others because they're not yet worshiping God. They're worshiping something else and it's killing them. And so we go and share Christ with others because people do not yet know our Savior. We want to begin now to do what we'll do forever. This is just practice. So we do it to get ready. And so I'm going I'm to land with this. Worship sends us out. You know, this week, we all saw the images of people who are going through so much uh, in Houston. And so we saw people of different backgrounds and races, you know, ethnicities, even different, gosh, languages, people from all kinds of walks of life, economic background, all nations. And haven't you been proud to be a Texan as the nation and the world watches the people of Houston? You see, friends, when you're focused solely on rescuing people from the flood, nothing else matters. And this is the church. When we're united around the ones and we're living out the four graces of humility and gentleness and patience and love, nobody in Houston is going, bro, what kind of color boat is that? Nobody's saying, but you're, you, we don't need your boat. Nobody's saying, wait, um, are you serious with those life jackets? The faded orange. I don't think so. Nobody's doing that. Everybody's all in. Why? Because there's one central focus. It's rescuing people from the flood. And this is what we're doing as a church. We exist to exalt Christ, to praise Him and to worship Him as one. And we go and we seek to rescue people from the flood. Friends, the church is not a cruise ship. It is a rescue boat. And we are on mission only designed to rescue people so that they too will worship our Savior. Ultimately, there's another flood that's coming. I love what Habakkuk 2.14 says. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. 
That's where all of life is heading. And as you consider your commitment to the discipline of weekly worship, never again take it lightly. Make plans now to be here on time next week. And then the next week. I know there are times we miss, but you come then the next week. And what's going to happen over time is the gathering of the saints is going to change the trajectory of your life. Show me your habits this week. I'll tell you who you are becoming next month and a year from now and five years from now. Do not neglect the gathering of the saints. Value something more than simply your own schedule and time. Listen, I can say it this way. If you value something more than exalting Christ as Savior together with the family, your priorities are out of whack. So let's commit ourselves anew to Him. I want us to pray together. Would you bow your heads and just close your eyes with me? And we're going to close our time in prayer. And I just want to challenge you. First of all, do you know Christ as Savior? Do you know Him? And if you've not received Him, you're not yet a part of the family of God, you can do so even now. Just say, Lord, thank You for dying on the cross for my sin. Come into my life and make me the person You've created me to be. I give You my life. And friend, if you have kind of fallen asleep, I mean, honestly, if the Spirit has convicted you today, uh, I want you to, want you to wake up. Be reminded of how important it is. The gathering weekly. Parents, get your kids here. Make it the priority of the family. Friends, encourage friends. Invite others to come. How good it is to do something in this hour that we will not do all week long anywhere else. And it changes us. Lord, thank you for the gathering. Thank you for your idea of the church. That we get to do this. We're saved from our sin. But we're saved into community. And on mission with you. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Houston on this day of prayer. And we pray that you would bless them. The churches who've gathered. And those who have no place to gather today. And we pray that you'd remind us as we go into the flood. This week of sin and of, of pain and the suffering of people we know, that we'd reach down and rescue them in the name of Jesus. Lord, help us to be a church that is on mission for you. Help us to love the world this week and to draw people into the family. And God, I pray as we gather together as a church family every week that we be unified. I pray for those who need to be baptized, those who would receive you as Savior today, that they would not leave this place without talking. So God, we praise you. We love you. We thank you for Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.